Well, good morning, Southeast, and happy Mother's Day this Sunday morning, and good to have all of you here today. We have plants for all of the moms who are with us today. Our opening scripture is found in Hebrews chapter 4, and we've been working our way through Hebrews slowly but surely on Friday nights. And so Hebrews chapter 4, and I'm going to start at verse 6. So Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6, down through verse 11. Hebrews 4, 6 through 11. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. Thank you for waking us into your grace and into your goodness. And thank you for this Mother's Day. And we pray that as we come together, that you would be honored and glorified in our midst. Draw us near to you, however we might be gathered, uh, whether here in person, whether on Facebook Live, whether later on on YouTube. Lord, draw us into your presence and accomplish your will in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, take your songbooks and turn with me to number 372. Hymn number 372, and you're welcome to stand and join me in singing. The song is I Am Resolved, number 372, I Am Resolved, and I invite you to stand and join with me. Vaughn will be here next week. Uh, she's back in Michigan for a few more days with her mom. She sends you her greetings, and I'm looking forward to her return. Uh, Psalm number, song number 372, I Am Resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Amen. And you may be seated. And we want to turn over to Psalm number 19 in your Bible. Psalm number 19 is our prayer psalm today. 
Psalm number 19, and we have a few prayer requests that have come in. Uh, Nina requested prayer for her older sister, China. Uh, China has had a number of heart stents put in, and the doctors just told her that she needs to get her affairs in order, that they don't think she has too long to live. And so if we could pray for Nina's sister, China. And then if we could pray for Joe and Donna there in Colorado visiting Donna's mom, or excuse me, her, her dad, and he's not doing real well. And so if we could remember Donna's dad in prayer this morning, that would be a good thing as well. Also want to thank the Lord for all of our moms. And I know that Mother's Day, as much as it's a joyful day, it can also be a day of sorrow for various reasons. And so just that the Lord would be especially near to uh, all of those for whom this is a difficult day. And so what we'll do is we'll I'll lead us in Psalm 19, and then I'll pray, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer together. Psalm number 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Let us continue to pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this day and for your goodness to us and your many blessings upon us. And Lord, thank you for the moms that you have blessed us with. Uh, we want to honor them and just thank you for how you use them to show us your love, to show us your goodness, and so often the case to teach us your ways. And so, Lord, we pause and we just say thank you for our moms today. And, Lord, we thank you for the moms of our children today. Uh, thank you especially for Vonda today. And just pray your blessing upon her and that you'd be near to her, strengthen her today, give her your rest today. And just may she sense your presence and your joy today. And thank you for the wisdom that you have given her and the energy that you have given her for our children. Uh, Lord, I am just so grateful and give you praise for Vonda today. And then, Father, we pray that you would be near those who are missing their moms today and moms who are missing their children today. And we know that that missing can be caused from all different kinds of reasons. We know that there is death, and so there are uh, grieving going on today because of moms who have passed or children who have passed. And then, Lord, we also know that sometimes relationships can get pretty messed up. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be with all the moms who are grieving their children today and children grieving their moms because that relationship's not right. And we pray, Father, that you would bring about peace, that you would bring about reconciliation. We pray, Lord, that you would make a way for things to be made right. Lord, we thank you for how you are faithful and how you are with us and the peace that you give us and the confidence that we can have in you. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation more than anything. Thank you for sending Jesus, your son, to die on the cross for our sins, that we could know peace with you. And thank you for the change that you bring about in our lives so that we're no longer living enslaved to sin, but we can live under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the grace that you give us, the power that you give us to love and to trust you and to bear with each other. And we pray that you would make us more and more Christ-like, that you would help us by your spirit to trust you wholeheartedly and to hold nothing back from you. 
And we also pray, Lord, that you would help us to grow and increase in our love for one another, that we would practice forgiveness as we have been forgiven, that we would show the love that, to others that you have shown to us. Thank you for brothers and sisters in our lives who teach us your ways, who help us to walk more faithfully. Lord, that's the kind of brother or the sister that we want to be. Help us not to be stuck upon ourselves. Help us not to be self-consumed, whether we're trapped in self-pity or chasing dreams and ambitions. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we would be a Christ-centered people, and in that, that we'd be able to live life looking upward to you and outward to each other, and that we wouldn't be so stuck on ourselves. And Lord, we pray that you would be with each one who is here today. Lord, you know the things that are upon our hearts, unspoken requests, Lord, we bring these to you. We pray that you would be with Nena today and with her sister, China. Uh, Lord, what difficult news to receive. And we pray, Lord, that in these days that she does have, that you would guide her, that you would give her wisdom, that you would draw her near, that she would know your peace and she would know the fullness of your salvation. We pray for healing, Lord. We place her in your hands. We pray your will be done. And Lord, really, these are the only days that any of us have. We never know how many we have. But we pray, Lord, that you would help us to live rightly and that you would help us to keep in step with you that our peace with you would never be broken. And Father, we pray that you would be with Donna's father. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen him, comfort him in these days, and be with the whole family. Uh, Lord, we know it can be a difficult time watching a loved one grow weaker and weaker. And so, Lord, we just lift them to you and pray that you would sustain and that you would be near to them and just hold this family dear. And then, Father, we know that there are other requests today. We pray that you'd be with Rocco, we lift him. He, he checked in this week. We ask for your touch upon him and his concerns. And Lord, these are, these are just a few. Uh, I know there's many more. But Lord, we count it such a privilege, such a joy to be able to bring all of life to you, to cast all of our cares upon you because you so care for us. And so we pray that you would move and that you would undertake and that you would instill, with it, instill within us confidence that you are at work and that you are accomplishing your will. May we know your rest, no matter the circumstances that we find ourselves in, the chaos that's around us. Lord, empower us to rest in you. And Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for this world. Uh, so much brokenness and strife and violence just all around us and all around this globe. We pray for your people, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful and true to you. Lord, we want our leaders to look to you, to humble themselves. We pray that you would guide them, whether they know it or not, uh, and draw them uh, into your ways. But Lord, we pray for your church, wherever it's at, here, across the street, downtown, across the globe. Uh, we pray that we would especially be seeking you first. We who, we who know you, help us to truly seek you and help us to live under your lordship and use us, Lord, to be a witness of the change that you make, of the peace and the salvation that you've accomplished in Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, I have a couple of questions for you today, as you might suspect. And so the first question for you is to share one thing that you're thankful for about your mom. And so go ahead. Uh, you can kind of turn your chairs, face each other if you would like, or uh, if you don't like who you're sitting closest to, go join somebody else's circle. But one thing that you're thankful for about your mom, I'll give you a minute to share.
All right, my next questions. Hopefully everybody got to share. My next questions, maybe not so sentimental, this, this one, um, but it's got two parts. I'll give you part one. In your mind, what is the most powerful city in the world? The most powerful city in the world. Give you a quick minute on that one. Okay, question number two, or part two of that question. In your mind, what is the most glorious city in the world? So most glorious city in the world, the one with the brightest lights. All right, that's enough questions for today. Uh, turn with me, well, there might be some more, but turn with me to Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13, and our passage is, I'll admit, it's on the long side today. Uh, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 1, through chapter 14, verse 27. So the passage is long, maybe we'll try to keep the sermon short. We'll see what we can do there. But Isaiah 13, 1 through 14, 27, and we are entering into a new section of Isaiah. And so we've been through 7 through 12 now, where there's just kind of this intense focus on Ahaz and Assyria and the two kings to the north that were threatening Ahaz. And we've seen that Isaiah is able to see kind of near into the future and deep into the future. And that judgment is going to come upon them, upon Israel and Jerusalem, because they did not trust in the Lord. And if you recall, Ahaz made a deal with Assyria to protect him from the two kings that the Lord told him he didn't have to worry about. And rather than trusting in the Lord, he trusted in Assyria. And so it was going to be a very costly, very costly trust. And Assyria was going to come through, take over a lot of the villages of Judah, and even reach the point where they are going to have Jerusalem surrounded at one point. And so uh, Ahaz cost himself, he cost Jerusalem, his people, quite a bit by not trusting in the Lord and trusting in Assyria instead. Uh, but we also got the good news that the Lord was going to be faithful to save, and that the Lord was going to use the Assyrians to kind of transform, purify the Israelites so that they would actually place their trust in the Lord. And so he's able to kind of see deep into the future and eventually in terms of a new son of David that the Lord will raise up to establish his kingdom and to bring his justice and his righteousness and his peace. And so now we move into this new section that begins at chapter 13. And this section runs from chapter 13 all the way through chapter 23. And this section is known as oracles against the nations. And so in passage after passage, Isaiah is going to have a message, typically a message of judgment, that is going to be against other nations. And let me go ahead and read our passage today, and then we'll talk a little bit more about that. So Isaiah chapter 13, and starting at verse 1. An oracle concerning Babylon that Isaiah son of Amos saw. And basically an oracle is a, is a speech. And so it's a, it's a word that he has. An oracle concerning Babylon that Isaiah son of Amos saw. Raise a banner on a bare hilltop. Shout to them, beckon to them, to enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my holy ones, I have summoned my warriors to carry out my wrath, those who rejoice in my triumph. Listen, a noise on the mountains like that of a great multitude. Listen, an uproar among the kingdoms like nations massing together. The Lord Almighty is mustering an army for war. 
They come from faraway lands, from the ends of the heavens. The Lord and the weapons of his wrath to destroy the whole country. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish grip them. They will ride like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at each other, their faces aflame. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I will make man scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. Like a hunted gazelle, like sheep without a shepherd, each will return to his own people. Each will flee to his native land. Whoever is captured will be thrust through. All who are caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be looted and their wives ravished. See, I will stir up against them the Medes, who do not care for silver and have no delight in gold. Their bows will strike down the young men. They will have no mercy on infants, nor will they look with compassion on children. Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride, will be overthrown by God, like Sodom and Gomorrah. She will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. No nomad will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will rest his flocks there. But desert creatures will lie there. Jackals will fill her houses. There the owls will dwell, and there the wild goats will leap about. Hyenas will howl in her strongholds, jackals in her luxurious palaces. Her time is at hand, and her days will not be prolonged. The Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. Aliens will join them and unite with the house of Jacob. Nations will take them and bring them to their own place. And the house of Israel will possess the nations and men servants and maidservants in the Lord's land. They will make captives of their captors and rule over their oppressors. On the day the Lord gives you relief from suffering and turmoil and cruel bondage, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has come to an end, how his fury has ended. The Lord has broken the rod of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, which in anger struck down peoples with unceasing blows and in fury subdued nations with relentless aggression. All the lands are at rest and at peace. They break into singing. Even the pine trees and the cedars of Lebanon exult over you and say, Now that you have been laid low, no woodsman comes to cut us down. The grave below is all astir to meet you at your coming. It rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you, all those who are leaders in the world. It makes them rise from their thrones, all those who are kings over the nations. They will all respond. They will say to you, you have become weak as we are. You have become like us. All your pomp has been brought down to the grave. Along with the noise of your harps, maggots are spread out beneath you and worms cover you. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned of the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a desert, who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home? All the kings of the nations lie in state, each in his own tomb. But you are cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch. You are covered with the slain, with those pierced by the sword, those who descend to the stones of the pit. Like a corpse trampled underfoot, you will not join them in burial, for you have destroyed your land and killed your people. The offspring of the wicked will never be mentioned again. 
Prepare a place to slaughter his sons for the sins of their forefathers. They are not to rise to inherit the land and cover the earth with their cities. I will rise up against them, declares the Lord Almighty. I will cut off from Babylon her name and survivors, her offspring and descendants, declares the Lord. I will turn her into a place for owls and into swampland. I will sweep her with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord Almighty. The Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will stand. I will crush the Assyrian in my land. On my mountains, I will trample him down. His yoke will be taken from my people and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the plan determined for the whole world. This is the hand stretched out over all nations. For the Lord Almighty has purposed and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out and who can turn it back? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day, and we do thank you for being a God who speaks to us. And we pray that as we look to your word, that you would speak afresh, that you would help us to hear you and to receive you and to obey you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, well, I, I agree with you. That's quite a long passage, and I'm sure you are wondering, when is it ever going to end? Um, it's lengthy. It's got a lot in there, and we're not going to be able to really kind of go through quite verse by verse by verse, but I want to talk to you about kind of some key themes in it, and then especially in terms of, as we get started, this section, Oracles Against the Nations. And so, so far, most of what Isaiah has been saying has been to the people of Jerusalem, and he's spoken to Ahaz, he's spoken to the people of Jerusalem, and he has had... He has had an oracle or two about Assyria and how, how the king of Assyria is arrogant and haughty and thinking that he's the one who's doing all of this and kind of having his own purpose of totally annihilating everybody. And the Lord said, no, I just, I'm just, you're the tool, the rod of my wrath, and I'm going to use you for punishment, but not to annihilate. And so judgment was going to come upon the king of Assyria eventually. Now, in this section from 13 through 23, Isaiah is kind of looking at all the nations that were in the world at that time that Israel was aware of. And so further to the east of Assyria, to the southeast of Assyria, you had Babylon. And then around Babylon, you also had a group of people known as the Medes, and they were known to be a very violent people. And he's going to go, Isaiah's going to go from Babylon, kind of across the world, across their world, uh, towards the west to Tyre. And so he's going to cover all the nations that he's aware of, and he has a word from God for each nation. Okay, but this is what we got to make sure we understand. Isaiah is not, Isaiah is not going on a road trip to each of those nations. Okay, Isaiah is not going on a road trip to Babylon to speak to the king of Babylon and to pronounce this oracle against Babylon in his hearing. Okay, Isaiah is saying this right there in Jerusalem, and there's no Babylonians there to hear it. Okay, and he's not going to go to the other nations either. He's not going to go down to Egypt. He's not going to go over to Tyre. He's not going to go to all these nations and say, hey, I have a message of, from God for you. Okay, he has a message against those nations. He has a message regarding those nations, but he's not going to those nations to deliver it to them. Who's he talking to? He is right there in Jerusalem proclaiming this message about the Babylonians for the Babylonians to the Jewish people who are right there in front of him. And you might be thinking, okay, well, what's the point of that if you have a message for the Babylonians but you're not going to go to Babylon to speak it. You're just going to speak it so that your people can hear it. Well, who's the message really for? Even though it's like a message to Babylon, the message is really for the people that are right there in Jerusalem for them to hear and for them to, to hear it and to learn from it. And so we want to be kind of asking ourselves the question, okay, why is it important for the Jewish people there in Jerusalem, why is it important for them to hear this message about Babylon? 
this message that concerns Babylon. How does it concern them? And what are they supposed to learn from? Uh, uh, learn from this message? So that's one of the questions that we'll be working with. And we just need to keep in mind that while it looks like it's a message to Babylon, that really it's a message for the Jewish people that are right there in Jerusalem. And so we're kind of going to kind of couch ourselves in with them and think about how, how we're hearing this message too. And it's a message for us. And I, I think the best way I know how to kind of think about big picture here is, remember what Ahaz did? Ahaz reached out to Assyria and wanted Assyria to protect him. And so he paid for this protection and it cost him dearly. And, and at some point, they probably began to realize, wow, this is really costly. It's cost us a lot of villages. It's cost us a lot of people. It's cost us a lot of gold and a lot of silver. Having Assyria protect us, this has really been costly. And so then they're probably starting to think, I wonder if we could have gotten a better deal with somebody else. And see, they would have heard of Babylon, and they would have known of the glory of Babylon. Remember my questions for you, the most powerful city and then the most glorious city? So Assyria was seen as the most powerful, and it was getting costly, and it was getting difficult to live. I mean, difficult is putting it mildly. To live under Assyrian rule or to live with Assyria kind of imposing its will upon you. It would have been very tempting to begin to think, what if we reach a little further and make contact with Babylon? Then maybe if we can make contact with the glorious Babylon, that Babylon could actually protect us from Assyria Babylon could actually do something to alleviate the pressure of Assyria, that Babylon might actually be able to save us. Are, are you catching it? Have you been in a situation like that? Where you reached out for one thing, and that one thing didn't work. But then you heard about something that sounded a little bit more promising, a little bit more glorious, and you reached out to that. And that didn't work. And then you reached out to this, and th that didn't work. I mean, you can just think about all different kinds of things, uh, from everything from, I don't know, stain remover. Have you tried one stain remover after another stain remover after another stain remover, and that stain is still there? And you've spent all this money on stain remover, and the next product always sounds better than the last product, and you still got stains on your shirt. Have you been there? Or your carpet? Okay, and that's just one example. I think about diet programs and programs to help you get in shape. I think about programs to help you make money. I think about all kinds of programs that if you just try this one. And so we kind of purchase that one. We try that one thinking that if I do this one, this one will work. And then next thing you know, you spend a lot of money on it. And nothing's changed. Maybe things have gotten worse. But then you hear about something else that's more glorious, more shiny. And so you go for that one, only to get the same results. See, I think this is where they're at. That they reached out to Assyria to protect them from those two kings to the north. And sure enough, Assyria protected them from those two kings to the north. They didn't have to worry about them anymore, but now they had an even bigger mess on their hands with Assyria. And so what can we reach for? And instead of looking to the Lord, the temptation was to look to Babylon. And we've heard about how glorious Babylon is and the power and the luxury and the wealth of Babylon. Maybe if we could get in contact with Babylon, maybe Babylon would, would send emissaries who would speak on our behalf with the Assyrians, and maybe, maybe we could get Babylon on our side, and there would actually be salvation in Babylon. 
That, I think, is the temptation. And so Isaiah has a message to the Babylonians for the Jewish people to hear. Because really it's a message for the Jewish people. And if I were to just sum the whole thing up in a sentence, don't trust Babylon. Don't place your hope and your trust in Babylon because Babylon has no future. And if you're trusting in something that has no future, guess what? You have no future. And that, I think, is what Isaiah is doing here, is helping his people to see Babylon is not a solution. There is no future in Babylon. There is no future with Babylon. So don't jump from Assyria to Babylon. You need to trust in the Lord. And so let us walk through a few places here just to kind of see what, what Isaiah has to say here. And the first thing I want to call attention to is that the Lord is summoning an army against Babylon. And we don't know exactly who that army is. Sometimes it sounds like it's an army of angels, of uh, supernatural beings. But by the time you get down to verse 17, it looks like he's stirring up the Medes against them. And so the Lord is summoning the Medes, who in those days were at the ends of the earth, and summoning the Medes and is going to use the Medes in Isaiah's vision here to bring destruction to destroy Babylon, that there's this fierce people that God is going to raise up to bring an end to Babylon. Now, maybe more importantly than that is what's wrong with Babylon? So the Lord is going to raise up a people that is going to bring this horrific end to the Babylonians. And look at verse 6. It's referred to as the day of the Lord. It's going to be a day of destruction, a day of judgment. Uh, Isaiah says, wail, cry, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. And so he's kind of telling the Babylonians, hey, you better get ready to cry. You better be wailing. Because your end is about to come. And again, you Babylonians, look what's going to happen to you. Because of this, what the Lord's doing, all your hands are going to go limp. Every man's heart will melt. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. The men, their soldiers, are going to ride like a woman in labor. And they're going to look aghast at each other, their faces aflame. See, the day of the Lord is coming. And the Lord is going to make desolate your land. And destroy all the sinners. And look at verse 11. Here's the big why. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. God is saying that he is going to bring this destruction upon this glorious city of Babylon. Because of its pride, its haughtiness, its arrogance. Maybe I should say it's pridefulness. To God is going to humble them and make them desolate. And for all their strength, they're going to be, their hands will just go limp in fear and devastation. And, and then we go a little bit further. That this event is so big, it's like it shakes the heavens. That the sun's going to go out, the stars aren't going to shine, the moon's going to give off no light. That, th that this is like a, a huge catastrophic event, this judgment that God is bringing upon them and upon their world. And it, it's, it's going to be violent. It's just horrific. Look at verse 19. Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. Babylon will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. It's going to become a place where wild animals roam around. Just desolate. And so here you have this kind of crown jewel of a city. Glorious. The place that everybody wants to visit. The place where everybody's so impressed with their technology and with their luxury. It's like they got it all in Babylon. 
and it's going to be destroyed and turned into a desert that's uninhabitable. Babylon, you may know this. Babylon becomes kind of this symbol throughout the Bible for kind of human arrogance at its highest. So by the time we get to the New Testament, when the Christians are talking about Rome, sometimes they'll refer to Rome as Babylon. That Babylon becomes kind of this symbol of world power at its peak. And the message always is that that world power at its peak and all of its glory and all of its luxury, it's temporary. That it's going to come down. Whether we're talking Babylon, whether we're talking Rome, whether we're talking nation states and empires after that. That Babylon becomes kind of the code word, the symbolic word for those nations that reach that superpower status and this arrogance against God, thinking that they're the ones that make the world turn. And whenever a nation reaches that kind of arrogant state that it thinks it's the one that makes the world turn, God's got news. You're going to get flipped and made desolate. And the whole world will see that you don't make the world turn, that it's God. And so Isaiah is not speaking this directly to Babylon. Remember who's listening? The Jewish people there in Jerusalem are hearing him kind of speak against Babylon, and they need to learn the lesson. Wow, Babylon's temporary. I thought Babylon was going to be forever. With all of its glory and all of its luxury and all of its power, it's like Babylon today. Babylon was yesterday. Babylon's surely going to be tomorrow. And Isaiah said, no, the day of the Lord is at hand. So don't trust your tomorrow to Babylon, because Babylon has no tomorrow. He goes on. He reminds them, verse chapter 14, and we get this little bit of, well, this, this kind of salvation message kind of turns from the Babylonians and speaks to the Jewish people. The Lord will have compassion on Jacob, once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. Aliens, strangers will join them in that land and unite with the house of Jacob. Nations will, will take them and bring them to their own place. And the house of Israel will possess the nations as men servants and maid servants in the Lord's land. They will make captives of their captors and rule over their oppressors. And so in the midst of this kind of judgment on Babylon, we get this news that God is re-choosing his people Israel and that God is going to re-bless re them and resettle them in their land and that, that they're going to experience the peace of God, the blessings of God, and so much so that other peoples will want to join them and other peoples will even be servants within the people of Israel because of the peace, because of the life that is there. One commentary that I was reading, main commentary that I'm reading, talked about how in Jesus this is fulfilled. Because what are you and I to Jesus? Servants. He's our master, Lord, Savior. And so already we can kind of see this being fulfilled to where we have joined the house of Jacob as servants of the Messiah Christ, of Jesus. And, and so he's has this kind of hopeful note saying, look, don't go after Babylon. They got no future. You have a future because of the Lord, not because of Babylon. And it's even going to come about to where those who did you wrong, those who were your captors, they're actually going to want to join you. And they'll even be willing to be servants amongst you. Well, let's go further. This is where I think it gets really interesting. Verse 3. On the day the Lord gives you relief from suffering and turmoil and cruel bondage, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. And so you're going to taunt him. This guy that has been making your life miserable, you're going to taunt him. When's that going to happen? The day you get relief. When's the day you get relief? 
the day he dies. The day he dies, that's when you get relief, and that's when you're going to start singing. So, so listen to it. I'm not going to try to sing it. How the oppressor has come to an end, how his fury has ended. The Lord has broken the rod of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, which in anger struck down peoples with unceasing blows and in fury subdued nations with relentless aggression. If, if you go back and look at some of the annals of the kings of Assyria and the kings of Babylon, they really brag about how cruel they are. Like they took a lot of pride in their ability to be cruel and to inflict pain and destruction on the peoples and the places that they conquered. And so they would show no, no mercy to anyone. And they would try to devastate the land. And so when they went through, they weren't satisfied to just kind of kill the enemies. They also chopped down the trees just to show that they had the power and the control over the people and over nature to bring about destruction. And so this day of relief is coming, this day when Babylon experiences the judgment of God. And so you're going to sing that their fury has been broken and ended. And look at verse 7. All the lands are at rest and at peace. They break into singing. Even the pine trees and the cedars of Lebanon exult over you and say, now that you have been laid low, no woodsman comes to cut us down. Can you just imagine a forest in fear of a king? And the forest is in fear because they know this king is coming and they've heard the news that when this king comes, not only is he going to destroy the city, but he's going to, he's going to ravage the forest. And now the forest has gotten news that this king has died. And the forest, the pine trees, they're singing. Like we're not going to get cut down that you have been cut down and you're in the grave and we're still standing. And so the nations that have been under this oppression, they're going to be rejoicing and the forest, nature, will be singing and shouting about how this oppressor has now been destroyed. Now this is where I think it gets really interesting. Verse 9, the grave or Sheol, the underworld, the realm of the dead, the grave below is all astir to meet you at your coming. Now, I don't know if you've ever been somewhere where maybe a president was coming through and, you know, a high dignitary. And they got the motorcade and streets blocked off and all this stuff. Uh, there was one time back in, in uh, when would that have been, late 80s maybe? Reagan was the president, and I was coming across town, and the road was blocked off that I would normally go on down around Harbor. And the reason why I discovered was that President Reagan's motorcade was making its way, I don't know, to the airport or exactly where, but I mean, it's like that part of the city was just kind of shut down so that the president could come through. Everything was astir because the president was coming through. And maybe you've been someplace, maybe you've experienced something like that, seen that on TV, where it's like everything is astir, everything is shut down because this dignitary is coming or whatever it might be. That's what's going on in the underworld, in the realm of the dead. It's like everybody's talking, everybody's gossiping. Hey, do you know who's coming to town? Do you know who's about to move into our neighborhood? It's the king of Babylon, of all people. And so the whole underworld, all those who are dead, and you know how I bet a number of them died? At the hands of the king of Babylon. That you have all these kings that have conquered and all these armies that have been defeated, and they're all down there in the realm of the dead. And it's like they're all talking to each other and whispering to each other and there's a commotion that's stirring. Guess who's coming? The one who said he would never be here. The one who put us here. The king of Babylon. So listen, that, that's kind of the picture of it. So listen to how Isaiah describes it. 
The grave below is all astir to meet you at your coming, the king of Babylon. It rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you, all those who are leaders in the world. Kind of like, hey, guys, wake up, get together. We got to greet the king of Babylon. He's coming. It makes them rise from their thrones, all those who are kings over the nations. They will all respond. They will say to you, you also have become weak as we are. You have become like us. Maybe we were never able to be like you, but you've become like us, weak. All your pomp has been brought down to the grave, along with the noise of your harps. Maggots are spread out beneath you, and worms cover you. Again, I, I just think about ceremonies today. You know, and sometimes when an important political official uh, has served our country, they die. What's one of the ways that they're honored? They lie in state, right? Flag goes to half mass, their coffin is taken uh, to D.C., and they lie in state. And people are able to go by and pay tribute to them, and all the different politicians and leaders are able to pay tribute to them. And so it's, it's this really kind of, what, glorious moment? And then in the underworld, what are they saying? Welcome. You become like one of us. And for all your pomp and glory up above, guess what you're going to be sleeping on? Maggots. Guess what's going to be covering you? Worms. King of Babylon. All this glory and luxury and everybody made way for the king of Babylon. And in the end, welcome. You have a bed of maggots and a blanket of worms. Doesn't matter what's going on up above. This is your ending. And then we go a little bit further. Verse 12, some more taunting goes on. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly. On the utmost heights of the sacred mountain, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the grave to the depths of the pit. You boasted about how high you were making yourself. Equivalent or above the gods. Now where are you? You're with us, weak, powerless, sleeping on maggots. Those who, those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made the kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a desert, who overthrew its cities, who would not let his captives go home? It's just cruelty. Look at verse 19. 18 and 19. All the kings of the nations lie in state, each in his own tomb, but you are cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch. You wouldn't let people go home? You're going to be homeless and chill. That you're not going to have a resting place, but you will wander this underworld of death because you wouldn't let people even return after you made them captives. And so just, just taunting him and how he has destroyed his people. And so not only did he destroy other peoples, but his actions led to the destruction of his own people. And so the Lord is rising up against them. So verse 22, I will rise up against them, declares the Lord Almighty. I will cut off the Babylon uh, from Babylon, her name and her survivors, her offspring and descendants. I will turn it into a place for owls and into swampland. I will sweep her with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord Almighty. So Babylon has no future. For all of its glory and all of the power of its king, no future. No future. And then 24, attention gets turned back to Assyria. The Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be, and as I have purposed, so it will stand. I will crush the Assyrian in my land. On my mountains, I will trample him down. His yoke will be taken from my people and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is what the Lord is going to bring about. 
And so when I, when I think about all this and trying to get handles on it, it's a, it's a reminder to the Jewish people. The Lord is the one who's going to lift the yoke of the Assyrians from you. Don't look to Babylon to lift that yoke. It's the Lord who will do it. And the Lord will do it in his good time, in his right time. And so keep your trust in the Lord. Don't reach out to Babylon as if Babylon is a solution. Because the king of Babylon, he's going to be homeless in Sheol. So don't think that he's going to save you. And yes, I know that you're under the yoke of the Assyrians. I know that they are brutal and that they're oppressing you right now. But I'm going to lift that yoke. I'm going to do it. And so keep trusting in me. Place your hope in me. And so that's the word to the Jewish people way back there from Isaiah. And I think, okay, well, where do we fit into that? And, and what's this word for us? And I, I really hear it in terms of like that stain remover stuff. That so often we are willing to go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing, thinking that that's what's really going to make our lives click. That that's what's really going to give us peace, that that's what's really going to give us joy. You've probably known people that are that way in relationships. Where they go from one relationship to the next relationship to the next relationship. And it's like the Lord gets them free from one relationship that's been a bad relationship. And instead of looking to live life to the Lord, the next thing you know, they're looking for the next Babylon. That all oh, this person will do it all. And of course, you know and I know that no one person can do it all for you. Except the Lord. And, and so I, I just think that there are so many ways that we find ourselves in this same place. And, and I think in some ways, too, the church in, in America can find itself in this place. And I think churches are looking for, you know, ways to survive or ways to grow or ways to fit in or ways to be relevant or looking for some hope in a world that seems like it's getting dark at times and can seem like it's getting harder for the church to be the church. And so then you start to begin to think, okay, is there, is there you know, this group or this person or this party or this movement? And you get different, different persuasions of Christians where some place they're hoping this and some place they're hoping that, but the problem is, who's hoping in the Lord? Like, this is, this is almost comical. I don't know. Um, I think about California and how many churches were upset with, with Newsom and all of his requirements about COVID and all of his regulations about not meeting. And yeah, they frustrated me too. But I didn't hear him saying I, you know, calling me to do anything to where it got in the way of me worshiping the Lord and putting the Lord first, but it was frustrating. And so you 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 probably are aware of churches or Christians or people that can't wait for the recall and to get Newsom out of office. And you probably have some Christians that think Newsom was the greatest thing ever. But you have other Christians that think Newsom is real detrimental to California and can't wait to get him out of office. And now look at your options. Are they any better? I mean, they might be, they might not be. Who am I to say? But what it feels like is going from Assyria to Babylon. That we're just always looking for the next person in office to do a better job as if the next person in office is, gonna, is somehow our hope and our future. Or, or whether it's the next party to take control. Or whether it's the next movement to get the upper hand. That we end up thinking that somehow the future of the church 
the survival of the church, the welfare of the church is somehow dependent upon the next Babylon, the next Assyria, the next one in power. And so when we get someone in power that we don't like, we're always looking for someone who's more glorious and thinking that that one will bring it in. And again, I know we're all different political persuasions and, and, and all of that, but I think it's the same thing in terms of, wait a minute, we're not supposed to be looking for the next glorious Babylon. Our focus is supposed to be upon the Lord. That our hope is in the Lord. Not Newsom or Newsom's replacement. Not one party or another party or this movement or that movement. That if we truly are the people of the Lord, then the Lord is our hope. The Lord is our rock. The Lord is our salvation. And so we look to the Lord. And so this, this message against Babylon and all of its glory and how it's all going to be brought to nothing really makes me have to stop and think, wow, am I really looking to the Lord, the crucified one, as my salvation and as the hope and future of my life and of our lives and of the church? Or have I been deceived into thinking that maybe it will be Babylon? Maybe it will be the next empire, the next governor, the next party to control Congress, if it's not the one already controlling. Do you see how it kind of becomes a word to us? As strange as it may seem? And that all those glorious things and all those ones who are arrogant and pompous and think that, you know, they're the ones that make the world turn. Where are they going to end up? Yeah, in the grave. On a bed of maggots with a blanket of worms. Why would we ever place our hope in them? Jesus was crucified. But he was resurrected and exalted and reigns. And we have the promise that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so why would we ever look for the glory? Why would we ever be deceived by the glory of Babylon? when we have Jesus. And so uh, I, I guess in uh, thinking about Hebrews too, that from, from our Friday nights, that, that maybe we need to make sure that we don't kind of go back, but we hold fast to Jesus. He's the one we rest in. And we keep our eyes on him in the midst of all the sparkling promises around us about stain removers. That is Jesus. He's our savior, he's our Lord. So I think about it kind of in terms of the church, and then as, as, I was, as I was also saying, I think about it in terms of us individually and just how in our personal lives it's so easy to go to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, as if that next thing is what's really going to give us peace, what's really going to give us life, what's really going to give us hope. No. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So... Maybe one, one quick story since it's Mother's Day. And I think I've shared this with you before, but when, when my mom was dying of cancer, um, the doctors always had one more solution to try. And, you know, and, and not putting blame on the doctors or anything, but one more thing to try. You know, whether it's surgery, whether it's radiation, whether it's chemotherapy, it's kind of like always one more thing to try, always one more shiny thing out there. And you try this, and it's painful, and it doesn't work so well, but there's this, we could still try this, and you do that. Finally, we kind of got to the end of all that. And this one Christian doctor who went to our church, he wasn't one of my mom's doctors, but Christian doctor uh, went to our church, and he asked if he could meet with our family. And, and so we said, yeah. And he just said, hey, I, I, I think you need to know that there's no cure. 
that they can promise about trying a whole bunch of stuff, but you need to know that there's not actually a cure for this cancer. And we got that meeting about two weeks before my mom passed. And what that meeting did was it helped us to really refocus on Jesus. Not to be so focused on the next thing to try, but to be focused on Jesus. And to know that Jesus didn't need extra time to heal my mom, that he could heal her whenever he chose. And that we didn't need to be in fear that there wasn't anything left to try or even what they might have way back there to try, then no, our focus was on Jesus. And those last two weeks of my mom's life, the only way I know how to really describe them, holy, that we just felt the Lord's presence with us and with her. When we were gathered together as we went through those times, um, wasn't easy, but at the same time, there was rest. Focused on Jesus instead of the next glorious Babylon. And so that would be my invitation to you today to kind of hear this word against whatever Babylons are out there and to kind of realize afresh those Babylons have no future and so they can't give me a future. The only one who can give me a future is the one who was raised up from that bed of maggots never really needed that blanket of worms to stay warm that God raised him and he's victorious and he is victorious for you and me that we can live and be at rest no matter the chaos around us and the assurance of eternal rest with him in glory would you pray with me? Mm-hmm. Father in heaven, thank you for again for this day and your goodness to us and your blessings and for speaking to us through your word. Lord, we confess that so often we get our eyes on the Babylons of, around us. All the shiny stuff, all the glorious stuff, all the stuff that is exalted on this earth so easy for our attention to go there and then then our attention goes there and the next thing we know that our hope is there and the next thing we know that we begin to think that wow if we could just get in touch with that Babylon get in good with that Babylon and if we could have that Babylon that our lives would be good and we'd have a future Lord help us not to be deceived help us to recognize that every glorious Babylon it has no future And so it can't give us a future. We pray that today and this week you would help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you, Jesus. Knowing that you are the one who conquered the grave and knowing that you are the one who has life for us. Help us to rest in you no matter what goes on around us. That we might have life in you eternally. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. But would you take your songbook and turn with me uh, to the song that we open with, I Am Resolved. Let's see if I can find it again. And I invite you to stand. And it is number 372, number 372. And I invite you to join with me. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is a true one, He is a just one, 
He hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is a living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Amen. Place your hope in Jesus. If you haven't done that, just talk to him. Jesus, help me to place my hope and my trust in you. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 God bless. Have a wonderful week. Keep your eyes on Jesus and off of Babylon. Amen. Oh, happy Mother's Day again. And we do have those plants in the back for all the moms. <laughs>